Hey guys, just before we start the video, um, I apologize in advance, but there are like three houses being built on my street at the same time, so I'll try my best to edit out any like background noise or sounds, but if any loud thumps or whatever get in the way, I apologize. There's a bunch of forklift certified people outside, and out of respect for their talent, I must let it continue. No, but seriously, I'm sorry if it does cause a damper on your experience, but nevertheless, I hope you enjoy the video. The Why No One Place episodes that I find most fascinating to work on feature champions who once had a commanding presence in the meta back in the old days but have fallen off for various reasons, and that happens to also be the case for many of you. The factors that make actual unpopular champs like Yorick, Skarner, and whatnot unpopular are self-evident, but it's not as clear as to why, for example, Lilia fell off or Ari lost a lot of market share prior to her mid -scope. It's also a good way to evaluate the changes in the game's landscape and development, prioritizing different things now than what was emphasized in the past. A champion who used to be almost ubiquitous throughout the mid-2010s was Orianna, a staple mid laner who according to many was never a bad pick under pretty much any circumstances. Even nowadays, you'd be hard pressed to find a scenario where having Orianna isn't a benefit for your team, and this sentiment unexpectedly permeated both pro play and solo queue across pretty much every rank. Normally, a champion is popular in one area but not so much in the other, such as no one playing Nasus in Diamond and above, but he's a regular site in Gold and below. I'm excited to look into this one, so let's not waste any more time and discuss what happened to Orianna, why no one plays her anymore. The mid lane is one of the more meta-resilient roles out there, second only to support. When I say meta-resilient, I refer to the likelihood of champion volatility, as in how likely are direct or indirect things to affect the champion's play rate. Even as champions and items get buffed or nerfed, the mid lane bears witness to a very consistent array of champs. Zed will always be around, Yasuo, Ari, Annie, and such in terms of pick rate. And in terms of win rate, I can't remember the last time Anivia, Cassiopeia, Swain, and Talia weren't above like 51. While top jungle and bot lane drastically shift their pools around, mid lane remains relatively the same barring the occasional new kid in class. Orianna's current situation is not the worst out there. Season 13 has been rather kind to her patch-wise in the fact. At the beginning of the year, she had a few quality of life touch-ups and some extra damage packed into her ultimate, then in version 13.4 she got even more quality of life buffs, and then in 13.12 not too long ago her ultimate got a substantial boost in power late game. So for all we know, by the time you see this video, it will make no sense. Be that as it may, compared to her average 10-15% pick rate back in seasons 4 through 8, a pick rate of 3-4%, while not bad in objective terms, suggests she's not a high priority target anymore, especially with her non-existent ban rate. Gimmicky champions are a fickle bunch. For some, the gimmick in question compromises too much practicality for personality, as evident by the likes of York, Skarner, and Old Aesol. For others, the gimmick can actually enhance their practicality. Rengar with his brush mechanic, Camille with a precision motif, or Jin trading speed for power. Historically though, Orianna was part of the second half, unusual for someone belonging to the Puppet Master archetype. Orianna was the first widely acknowledged Puppet Master champion in the game. All of her abilities are based around a levitating sphere aptly named the Ball. She could remotely control the Ball's position to attack and defend at her discretion, but unlike most Puppet Masters, the Ball can also interact with her, losing hardly any of her pressure even if you manage to break past her puppet and attack her directly. Not many players are a fan of Puppet Master characters in any game for the simple fact that it feels disorienting for your combat faculty to be attached to an external element, not the character you're operating. More so, that character is completely helpless in exchange for said external element. Orionis Ball is different in this regard. Alongside its ability to be a tangible threat on its own, it can also attach to allied champions including yourself, temporarily making them the ball. So on the off chance you get attacked, you're not completely at mercy of the enemy since you can recall the ball to yourself and gain all of its offensive properties, compared to someone like Azir who entirely depends on his soldiers, both the ones he instantiates and those from members divide in order to keep himself safe. The champion itself is never the source of your concern. I guess in a way you can think of it like Stark's Iron Man suits from Mark 42 and onwards. They can detach and function autonomously without requiring him to be within the suit to operate, but they can still wrap around him if need be. Oriana's ball is less of a puppet and more of an extension of herself, although functionally she's still very akin to a puppet master. This distinction is what allowed her to be much easier to pick up compared to an authentic puppet master like Azir. The barrier of micromanagement is much lower for her, which frees up your attention for the game itself, and she definitely needs to pay attention to many things. The two reasons why Oriana was so popular back in the day are actually the two reasons why she's not popular right now. Her trademark asset was her flexibility in a role that crucially demanded it. The mid lane serves as the ancillary role of the team given its position right dead center on Summoner's Rift. Champions in mid were expected to respond to any situation possible. Mages in particular were well suited for that responsibility due to their range pressure, generally good wave clear, and terrific late game scaling. So while AD carries were exclusively meant to focus on damage, mid laners were DPS, support, pick potential, ganking pressure, wave clear, so on and so forth. Oriana could not have been better equipped for this. 
Through command attack and distance, she had an easy way to exert pressure in an area at a moment's notice, and the damage from both attacks were enough to wave clear quite nicely while chunking enemy health bars after she got some AP. As a result, she had a deceptively threatening neutral game. Dissonance was an instant cast ability stemming from her ball, and provided she wasn't dragging it halfway across the screen, it was pretty hard to react to a sudden reposition followed by W. For almost every other champion, skill shots and damaging abilities originate from the caster, but for Orianna, she could be chilling on the tower, but if her ball is standing right next to you, you had to get out of her range ASAP. In terms of support, she had command to protect, granting bonus armor and magic resist and a shield to whoever the ball is attached to. And unlike her Q, the travel speed of her ball when using E is extremely fast. This meant she could defensively and offensively support her team at the same time, as they would now be the ball, which meant you had to not only worry about their own pressure, but Ori's W damage to boot, not to mention the bonus movement speed her allies would get and the reduced movement speed the enemies would get. Oriana's talent for alternating between offensive and defensive pressure made her arguably the best mid laner in the game from a conceptual standpoint. She was a textbook example of what a mid laner should be, and was damn well good at her job. Were it that alone, she may not have been the most exceptional champion out there, but they compounded her flexibility by giving her a super ultimate that can play off that versatility. Command Shockwave's reputation precedes itself. Even though we don't see Oriana play that often anymore, anyone with sufficient playtime knows exactly what it does and how dangerous it can be. It's not really the damage that makes it such a threat, although after the buffs it got, 550 plus 95% AP can easily amount to over 1000 damage in the late game. Anyways, it's that once again, it can happen anywhere, at any time, with anyone. Oriana can use Command Shockwave manually with their ball, and it will be the same kind of big boom burst ultimate as Zanny's Tibbers. She can use it on herself the moment someone attacks her for disruption. She can use it to protect a teammate in the same way. She can also use it to transform anyone into a Malphite ultimate. The range of use cases for Shockwave cannot be overstated. It was the best wombo combo ultimate for the longest time, especially back then. Now, how did those two assets become flaws for her? One word, availability. Oriana was popular because 8-10 to 10 years ago she was one of the only champions capable of achieving the long list of things I just went over. Other mages had similar levels of utility but were missing something in some way. For example, Anivia also had fantastic area control but she couldn't shield her team or corral enemies together. Twist of Fate had offensive and defensive pressure but it was limited to one target at a time. Victor also had external damage and crop control but like Anivia he was purely offensive. Few could come close to Oriana's versatility and that mattered a lot when determining who to play. Before Riot started ruining the game, before Riot desegregated the champion roster for the 5 roles, their expectations were very cut and dry. If you were in top lane, your job was to play tank, bruiser, or split pusher. Hardly any mages, assassins, or ranged top laners, if there were any, were acceptable broadly speaking. Junglers back in the day were also quite stringent on who you could play. There weren't a lot of assassins, hyper carries, and mages back then because those champs had neither the sustain nor clear speed to survive that kind of environment. So, your choices were either tanks or fighters. Bot lane, same thing. The AD carries of old offered nothing but physical damage. We didn't have mages or AP marksmen back then. You get the idea. Option selection was not as diverse, and so every role had their own job and purpose with the team that could be filled by no one else. Things are different now, you can basically play everyone in every role now. Top lane is tanks, bruisers, mages, assassins, skirmishers, specialists, and teemo. The pool of viable junglers has effectively tripled over the last 5 years. We have champs in there that weren't there before like Karthus, Graves, Wukong, Diana, alongside a bunch of new ones like Viego, Lilia, Belveth, Ivern, and Kindred who pushed the envelope of what could be fielded in there. As a consequence, the need for a do-everything mid laner has diminished a lot. That's why you're seeing more assassins or specialized mid laners like Zoe for long range poke, Silas for skirmishing, and so on. So while Oriana still has a lot of things in her toolkit, her jack of all trades motif is becoming more of a hindrance than a benefit. In terms of range, she caps out at I think around 1100 units, which isn't bad by any means, but she's gonna have a hard time against your long range snipers. In terms of damage, other mages can output way more pain than she can. It may not come with the added utility, but as I'm sure we all know, the best crowd control is death. Syndra, Karthus, Rumble, Victor, and Vlad overshadow Oriana in DPS by a wide margin, effectively eliminating the need for shields and whatnot since they can dispatch the enemy team faster. This is exactly why I believe Riot has been slowly creeping her damage up over time to compete with their more offensive peers. Look at Command Shockwave. From her release way back in version 1 to now, it's only ever gone up in damage. In 9.19, it went from 150 to 300 to 200 to 350 base and got 10% more AP. Then the buffs I covered earlier, like 13.1b and 13.12. Shockwave back then did 300 base plus 70% AP. Current Shockwave is 550 base plus 95% AP. Almost double the base damage and 25% more ability power. That's a measurable step up, but it's not enough. 
They have to be conservative when tuning up a jack of all trades character lest they become a master of all. Looking through her balance history though, most of her buffs and nerfs were not damage related. Usually it entailed cooldowns, mana costs, space stats, and utility. Her presence in pro play still needs to be heavily monitored, but naturally that comes at the cost of her solo queue popularity. Not just that, but Prevailing Wisdom has had to deal with the overinflation of the high mobility, high DPS meta we've been experiencing ever since 2018, where damage and speed took precedence over just about everything else. By contrast, Orianna's more neutral and control focused playstyle is not considered meta. Beyond that, she's also no longer the only one with an extensive repertoire like this. While not in copious amounts, more champions have been released with equal parts damage, control, team fighting, and or utility, and even if they don't have everything, the bases they cover further reduce the need for them to be covered by mid lane. One example of this is Seraphine. Seraphine's a more traditional Orianna in the realm of offensive and defensive versatility. She has very long range, good crowd control and area coverage, her W is a big AoE shield and a potential heal, and her ultimate is another super ultimate that's potentially even better than Command Shockwave. You also have champions with a more roundabout way of expressing the hybridization of attacking and defending. Galio's a good one. He deals damage, but also doubles as a tank with an ultimate that can be used to follow up on engage or protect his team. On the subject of ultimates, there are a lot more Wampu Combo ultimates these days. If we're talking big area control ability, there's a whole bunch of new ones like Yumi back when he used to root, Renata, Rel, Nico, the aforementioned Seraphine, Swain, Samira, Nila, Yona, and Diana to name a few. Diana, Rel, and Nila specifically have ultimates almost identical to Shockwave in function. What made Shockwave such a dangerous ultimate was that it was one of the only teamfight ults that forced enemies together. We had ults like Malphite, Wukong, and Amumu, but Shockwave made it much easier to attack everyone at the same time, whereas Amumu's ult rooted people, but if they were spread out to begin with, that would make things tricky. These days, a good number of champs have forcible displacement ultimates. Renata's ult causes the enemy team to get close to each other via Berserk, Sarah's ultimate draws enemies towards her usually in a cone, Yona's ultimate is a rectangular shockwave that puts everyone directly behind him. Hell, Aurelian Soul's Black Hole Thing Maduheki has a similar function, and it's not even an ultimate. Basically, in the olden days, Oriana was ahead of her time. She had versatility and area control that barely anyone else had. In addition, the range of options every role had were far more restrictive back then, giving mid laners even more of a reason to include her in their champion pool. Fast forward 10 or so years later, constraints have loosened up and everyone has caught up to her. More champions are out that can do the same things as she can, but better, or with more specialization. You now have essentially every champion class present in every role, so mid laners become more DPS carry heavy. Well actually, every role has become DPS carry heavy, which has been the main problem with League for going on 5 years now. Then of course, there's the underlying need for team coordination. Compared to other mages, Orianna has a very teamfight heavy subtext to her. While the environment of solo queue is progressively becoming more selfish, every man for themselves in nature. Even though she can use Command Shockwave on her own, it's a lot more effective when you can tag it onto a J4, Lee Sin, Vi, or someone who can unga boonga their way into the enemy team. If Orianna walks up to fish for a shockwave, it looks very obvious. At that point, if you were going to try to get a wombo combo ultimate on your own, you might as well play someone like Fiddlesticks, Kennen, Diana, or Vex, who are the Command Shockwave. Granted, none of this in any way detracts from her usability. Everything that was working for her before still works for her now, but she went from being the only choice to being everyone's third, maybe fourth choice. And even though her skill floor isn't as demanding relative to Azir, she's still a puppet master. The puppet master playstyle is an acquired taste. Players would rather have their abilities originate from the person who's at the center of the screen most of the time. I like Oriana. I actually have a thumbnail of her from my now defunct perfectly designed series that I had half a mind to revive until I realized she kind of needs a what happened to episode. She's definitely one of League's best designed champions, but her moveset is getting on in years. I think the best way to bring her back is to, unfortunately, power creep her a bit. They're hesitant to buff her cause pro play, but really she doesn't need a rework or anything. Just give her a little more oomph. Which I mean, they already have, so who knows, maybe Oriana will come back in full force. Anyways, that's gonna be it for today. Let me know your thoughts on Oriana in the comments down below if you agree or disagree with my points. As always, if you enjoyed the video, it would be great if you could leave a like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at Varsvarim, join my Discord server, and check out my other Why No One Plays episodes if you haven't yet. But till next time, thanks so much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.